Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, What's New This Week at One Schoolhouse. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and talk a little bit about what's coming up, and then we'll dive right in. But I want to welcome everybody. I'm Sarah Hanawab, the Assistant Head of School at One Schoolhouse. And before we begin, I'm just going to share a little bit about what's coming up later at One Schoolhouse. So we've got um, today's topic is the pedagogy of One Schoolhouse. And I can see from who's here that many of you have been uh, following One Schoolhouse's work for some time. So you'll see some things that are familiar and hopefully some new things. Um, on our blog this week, we have our head of schools post on intentionality in teaching and learning. So I hope that you'll enjoy that. And next week's webinar is one that is sure to be of interest to anybody who has to do hiring. What's different when you can't fly candidates in? And the nice thing about that is Brad and Kareen are going to share their experiences. Distance hiring, which is something they've been doing for years, rather than just the initial Zoom interview, what happens when much more of the process needs to move to online and distance friendly? And then I would be remiss if I didn't say that next week we begin building trust with faculty. This is a course that has really hit a nerve in the community. And so we've offered it one more time. And the real focus is not on, it's not on faculty growth and development. It, the focus is on rebuilding and repairing relationships that are collegial that may have gotten frayed and stressed during this year. And then we've got coming up, hiring during a pandemic, pandemic, observation and feedback. It's different this year. It's different this year is something that we're saying about a lot of stuff right now. And then we have discipline focused sections of a course called department leadership during a pandemic. And this is a course that really focuses on streamlining professional development, thinking or not professional, but streamlining the curriculum, thinking about what exactly has to happen and then how do we align department members so that next year doesn't feel like we try to do everything that we didn't get done this year plus everything that we would do next year and then everybody's back in the hamster wheel so i'm going to stop sharing welcome everyone here i'm sarah hanawald like i said assistant head of school for professional development at one schoolhouse and with me today i have two folks. I have Peter, who you can see. Peter, do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? And then I'm going to talk about our less visible guest. Sure. I'm Peter Gao. I'm the Independent Curriculum Resource Director at One Schoolhouse, and I'm very glad to be here. Great. Hey, and then with me on the phone is Corrine Dadini, who is the Assistant Head of School of One Schoolhouse. And Corrine, you've had several hats with One Schoolhouse. Do you mind just introducing yourself for a minute? And I'll say that Karine is on the phone because she is um, without power and has actually gotten herself somewhere where she can at least call in. So her dedication is very much appreciated. Thank you, Karine. <laughs> the only way you can work for a school is if you work for one schoolhouse when you live where I do, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you all. I am sorry I am not visible today. I look forward to being with you live in person next week. Uh, I am Keith Bottle Washer. I have been with One Schoolhouse for a number of years and seen our pedagogy through several iterations. So it is always a pleasure to be able to gather my thoughts and to be able to write them down in a form that is mission aligned and useful as an exemplar for schools, hopefully, but uh, more importantly, to guide our own internal work. Um, we write down who we are and what we value so that we can stay true to it as we take on different curricular initiatives. That's great. So Peter, one reason I wanted you to be in this conversation as well is to hear some of your thoughts about how an organization can use their mission and values to guide their pedagogy and their curriculum. Do you mind sharing a little bit of your experience in helping schools do that? Sure. I, I, I would say I, I would go back to what you just said and really focus on schools and missions and values since that's that's what I know best. And from the beginning of my career, I think, I was aware that schools had 
every school I've worked at, every school that I've gone to, and now the many schools I've worked with, all have these wonderful statements of their own purpose. Uh, mission statements, statements of values of one sort or another, uh, more recently, some other kinds of statements around uh, values relating to diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice. All of these things are values that schools have. And they also have academic programs. And sometimes those academic programs and sometimes the cultures of the schools in which those academic programs are, are seated, are embedded, it seems as though there's a disconnect between the values and the programs that the school is actually offering and the kind of atmosphere that the school is creating. And so I was fortunate enough to work at a school that really spent a long time for many years trying to figure out how best to live its values, how to be the best version of itself and what it said it was. And you know, did we achieve perfection? No, of course not. Nobody ever does. But it was a, a set of conversations and an ongoing conversation and a, what became an ongoing sort of ethos at the school that this is what we thought about. And then I was lucky enough to start working with other schools through the independent curriculum group before we merged with one schoolhouse a couple of years ago and really get into this whole business of mission aligned, values driven, school created academic experiences. Writ large, we'll call those things curriculum. Uh, not that everything that happens in a school is not its curriculum. So I think that this is just really important work. And one of the things that was exciting about coming to one schoolhouse, it was here was a place that had its mission and all of those things, but it also had this defined pedagogy that was subject to sort of constant iteration and discussion and conversation. And Corrine yeah. has been at the bottom of all that. So that's, that those is are my a, thoughts. <laughs> thank you. That is a lovely introduction. So Corrine, one of my questions is a little background of how these are produced from time to time. How do you know that, okay, it's, it's time for a new, uh, position statement. Thanks, Sarah. You know, one of the things I've been learning from Peter over the years is this idea that you are who you are, but that shouldn't be static. And I used to think that there was something antithetical about living and growing and changing and being true to your values and your mission. And there's not because um, who you are as an organization in our case, um, the work has to be mission aligned and values informed, but the practices have to be living. They have to constantly evolve. And so, yeah, this is the fourth version of our pedagogy paper. And the pedagogy paper at One Schoolhouse has always been research-based and practice informed. And those practices have to evolve. And so, so we know it's time for a new one in a couple different ways. One is when um, there's better research. So sometimes it's not so much the description of what we do that needs to be updated, but the fact that the citations need to be updated because there's better research or the research has changed and that has changed our practice. Um, and so sometimes that drives it. That was certainly the case this time around. There is some language that you've seen before in this statement, but the long list of citations has a lot of new citations. Um, and the other thing that helps us know it's time to change is that there's a, uh, it flows two ways. There's a real way that the pedagogy statement informs our teachers' practices, and there's also it goes the other way. The teachers' practices and what they're learning in our courses and from our students also informs how our pedagogy evolves and it shapes the work that we do. Okay, I like that. So it's a yin yang back and forth kind kind of thing. Um, you mentioned the the coursework with the teachers and students, 
And can you talk a little bit about the impact that the work that you do on maintaining the pedagogy paper, what's the impact on professional development for our teachers and the classroom experience of students? That is one of the things, uh, and Peter can speak to this as well, we do teacher growth really differently from any school I have worked in. And what's so fun about it is that when you come to teach with one schoolhouse, no independent school teachers need another thing to do at the end of a long day. But independent school teachers by their very nature are so interested in growth and practices that improve teaching and learning in their classrooms. And so every teacher who works with one schoolhouse doesn't show up because they want to get their initial orientation to how to teach online and then go do their thing. Um, they show up because they have the mindset that they don't teach psychology or artificial intelligence or Chinese inter intermediate too. They show up because they teach students and they care about student learning and outcomes. And so we have an annual cycle where our teachers learn new things every year. And many of you have heard me talk about this before. One school has teachers set annual goals. And one of the things that they can do within those goals is they can tackle a new aspect of our pedagogy or an aspect that um, together with our instructional coaches, they have determined is underdeveloped or just stale in their classes. And every year, something about their class gets markedly better because throughout the course of the year, they take on learning something new about their practice, their approach to teaching and learning. Um, and we have a, a living pedagogy class internal to one schoolhouse that those teachers can dive into whenever they want to update uh, their own practice. And then with our instructional coaches, over the course of the summer, they take whatever they have learned the prior year and they integrate it into their course as they prepare it for the following year. So this pedagogy statement, while it looks uh, like a, just a, a few pieces of paper to anyone reading it, it is actually alive in our system because everything that's in it has a pathway for teachers where they can watch videos, do exercises, take recommendations from other one school has teachers who have that particular practice mastered in their course, gain expertise from researchers and our coaches, and then they can integrate that work into their course. Wow. So I love the way you describe that as living. And so when you think about sort of if things come from or are generated on the one end, how do you see the results of this work and student outcomes? We measure it. <laughs> I know that's a novel concept. <laughs> there, there's a lot of metrics here at One Schoolhouse and there are feedback cycles that happen organically within our courses. And so we measure progress within the context of the course. And then there are ways that we measure progress that is larger than an individual class and set of students and actually tracks progress from one year to the next. So you have, measurement is key in any competency-based personalized, personalized learning. learning. And it's, and it's just one of the core values and um, tenets of the practice. And so we have always really valued feedback in the cycle. And uh, some of you will remember with me that metacognitive learning was a big thing how long ago peter 10 or 15 years that sounds about right i think even longer <laughs> i'd go back into the the early 90s <clears throat> okay i was still in school then peter <laughs> i don't know if my teachers were doing that <laughs> um but so the idea that students have a unique perspective that should be valued you should care how your students are experiencing your curriculum and your pedagogy so Within our courses, teachers ask for feedback from the students, and our teachers are really, uh, they're fearless. You know, they'll say to the students, okay, I'm trying something new. I've never built this type of activity in this way, and so I need your feedback on it. And they will, they will put out a little uh, a rubric or a little survey form for the students to weigh in, and then 
when they do that practice again a month later, maybe they've scaffolded it a little more, they'll compare the data. And so, so there, are, there are vibrant ways within our courses where teachers gather data and then iterate on their own practice. And um, I think the way this ties to something that is new in our pedagogy paper this time around, this fourth version, is that we spent more time this time talking about our two school-wide competencies. And what's important to know is that we track those. So within a course, what tracking might look like, one of our school-wide competencies is academic maturity. And a piece of that is that students will be able to collaborate with their classmates in the online space. And so a teacher who is interested in working on improving group work or collaboration or project-based learning that is done in partners in their course, there's lots of ways it could look, but the teacher will set, they're not just building different collaborative activities. They're also figuring out how am I going to measure my students change over time? How am I gonna know that the way I'm giving the instructions and the way the students are engaging, and the way that the students who are struggling is being um, addressed over time. So the students have a really hard time or say they don't like group work at the beginning, and everybody has those kiddos. Um, how am I gonna know that I am helping those kids gain the skills they need so that they don't not like it by the end of the course? Um, so that happens within the context of the course. Um, and then the other piece is that Academic maturity, one of our school-wide competencies, is also measured year over year within, the, with, uh, within our school surveys, and excuse me, our student surveys. We survey our students quarterly, and one of the questions that we ask is not in my jargony <laughs> pedagogy paper way, but we ask the students on a Likert scale, how much have you seen yourself grow in this area? And they report, and so we also have change over time, year over year? Is this course delivering the skills that grow this competency in children? And so measuring student outcomes is a really important piece of a competency-based personalized learning system. And there are a couple different practices that help us do that. Thank you. I'd like to, like to toss in a question, in a for, question Corrine. for Corrine. And, and you've used the term personalized learning, and I'm going to uh, ask that you explain that because I think there are still very many educators and certainly a whole lot of families, uh, parents and guardians out there who hear that term and in their mind what they are imagining is sort of individual differentiation so that uh, every kid is getting their own special sort of snowflake version of an education. And I think that's um, something that always needs clarification. I'm wondering if you'd take a minute and do that for us, please. I am happy to, Peter. This is actually what probably brought me to this administrative work. I probably would still be a classroom teacher if I had been able to answer this question. But I was looking around, feeling it myself, and looking at my colleagues and thinking, this snowflake deal in independent schools is wearing out our teachers. Because the idea that every child needs an individualized experience in your school is being done on the backs of your teachers. And it just, it, it couldn't continue. I couldn't abide that. That's not good for teachers and it's not good for students either because the world isn't built so that every child has exactly the experience that they want. And so I figured there had to be a way to empower both teachers and students to be more effective. And it brought me to Bray and McClaskey's research on personalized learning. And so the difference between personalized and individualized or differentiated, once you start doing it, it's really clear because everybody can breathe. And so that's your outcome, that you know you're doing personalized learning well. And so I like to think of personalized learning, and this, this is McCloskey talks in a lot of detail about this, but teachers in independent schools are really good at differentiated instruction. 
they're really good at setting up a lot of different ways to learn things. You assign the reading, you maybe post a video that students can watch. Um, in normal times, students come to class, you give a little lecture on it, you provide an activity. There's all these different ways that they're basically learning the same skills. So differentiation thrives in most independent schools, as does individualization. And individualized instruction is when you are sitting next to the student, you are providing additional activities for her to close a particular gap in math or she's coming to tutorial to workshop her paper because she came into your class with some writing deficiencies and needs to close those gaps so that she is up with her peers. Or a student is fascinated by a particular extra topic and so the chemistry teacher has to run an independent study for the child who wants to do organic chemistry because that's not part of your curriculum. And oh, by the way, that chemistry teacher who is running that independent study and that English teacher who is not just staying for tutorial, but she's staying till after track practice so she can do the workshop. Those things are all happening on the backs of teachers. And the children are thriving, maybe, doing all that extra work. Personalized learning takes those two practices and it builds it into the class before the class is delivered. So it makes everybody more efficient. So the student doesn't have to read the textbook and listen to the lecture and do all the practice problems. She can do the one that you, the teacher has worked with her to know this is her most efficient way of learning. And then she can check her understanding and if she didn't get it, she can go back and do one of the others. And so what you're doing is you are dramatically reducing the amount of front-loaded work that students have to do specifically to access new knowledge and practice new skills. And what I love about it is that that's why I came to personalized learning. <laughs> but personalized learning has a back end that is just massively inspiring because once you get that pathway choice down on how students access new knowledge and skills, you have all this extra time. So now your classroom is filled with application to the real world, more pathway choice, opportunities for students to take deep dives into their passions, applying what they just learned to something that is new or something that really shows you how they are transferring the knowledge to something new and so their outcomes are so much greater. So when I talk about personalized learning, I'm, I feel like I am talking about saving the soul of independent school education because it, teachers and students gain so much. And one schoolhouse, our work is predicated on the belief that, trans, that education needs to be transformed. And I know no better way to inspire learning than to reduce the workload of people while also making them, giving them access to things that make them want to learn more. That should be the definition of learning. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I could talk about it all day, Peter. <laughs> What's, the way it shows up in the new pedagogy paper is actually um, – the new thing that personalized learning is driving one schoolhouse to is actually inclusive innovation. And the idea that we have always been an innovative, cutting edge organization, and we are really holding ourselves accountable to how do we do that inclusively going forward. And so personalized learning, which is a practice that we have had for, um, I guess, going on seven years ago, we started working on this pedagogy and integrating it into our courses. But at this point, personalized learning is getting a, a new breath of fresh air because we're using these tried and true practices that we've worked on in order to um, hold ourselves accountable to how inclusive the learning experience is in our community. So, um, so I love how sometimes work is cyclical in education and a practice that you've been using and something new that you want to tackle can come together to, um, to create some interesting synergy. Corrine, can I ask another question? Uh, Sarah, can I ask another question uh, of Corrine? Uh, and that is, 
Corinne, as you were explaining the process of, of how one schoolhouse sort of puts courses together, you mentioned a couple of roles. And I'm just wondering if you could give like a, a, a very brief uh, description of a couple of the roles that you mentioned. One, instructional coaches, and two, instructional designers. And I'm just sort of wondering how those how those roles work at one schoolhouse, and uh, I, because I, I, I want to go back in. If I were in a brick and mortar school, I would be, <laughs> be grabbing those concepts. I think. So, is that just a quickie on this one, please, if you could? <laughs> no, Peter, you can't rein me in. I could talk about this for a long time. Um, instructional coaching at one schoolhouse is built on some really interesting research and it's not new research it came out in the early 2000s um but it was it was pretty deep research on the effectiveness of professional development in teachers and we've all had this these mountaintop experiences where you go to a workshop or your school brings in someone who's fantastic and you get your binder or you take a bunch of notes and you have a lot of stuff you want to take back to your classroom. And then you try it once or twice. Maybe there's some little gem that you use in an ongoing way, but it's hard to affect systemic change. And we all had that experience and we all just thought, oh, it's because we're so busy. Well, Annenberg actually showed that instructional coaching goes from you go from 15% effectiveness with the one-off professional development kind of experience to 85% effectiveness on integrating the exact same new practice for a teacher when you provide coaching follow-up. Now, <laughs> those kind of numbers don't exist when you're talking about um, affecting change. And so it's kind of a no-brainer to say, what our teachers need are not department chairs who are going to show them how to teach physics. I mean, yeah, someone's got to show up and show you how to use the new Vernier probes. But what you really need is someone who can be your accountability partner, who can observe your class and give you feedback, who can help you set a goal and then um, find the right metrics to measure your own change over time on that goal. And that is an instructional coach. And so here at One Schoolhouse, we have two folks who are in this role. And um, in the summer, they are our instructional designers, meaning that they meet regularly with faculty, usually between four and six times over the course of a two-month period to help the teachers design their course to the One Schoolhouse pedagogy specs. And so they are the designers. And they are helping the teachers actually do the work of building out the learning experience in our learning management system. And then throughout the year, those same two coaches pivot to focus on helping teachers grow in their goals-based growth. And I, I believed the research when I read it, and I could not, I don't know how to say any more strongly, Peter, that there's no better way to affect change in your school than to have someone be an instructional coach. And I think we've all experienced this in one way or another because we know that there are people in our schools who drive change because of the ongoing work that they do. And when you put the energy in your school into having someone whose job is designed for your pedagogical values and then coach teachers to bring those to life, um, the student experience grows measurably. Thank you. I, I think that's called putting your values into action really intentionally. <laughs> Works for me. So, question that I, I have to ask. Um, normally, folks will use the Q&A for questions, but we're about to wrap up, so we'll put this one in there, which is... How do you keep up? What are your go-to resources, Corrine? Because you keep mentioning research, and I think um, this question might be coming from someone who's a little overwhelmed. <laughs> I know. I know that feeling. 
um, it's not that I don't get overwhelmed. It's that my job is to keep abreast of pedagogical innovation and curricular innovation. And I couple that with what I'm seeing in our own classes and um, what Peter sees in the schools he works with, what you see in our own PD program, Sarah. And I'm a good listener. And I think when you listen to what is frustrating to teachers and you keep up with the research, you can see the bridge and you can provide it for them in a way that is digestible and they, they don't have time. Teachers don't have time to keep up with all of the research, but um, that's part of my job. I provide it in house to our own teachers and um, one schoolhouse provides it to our consortium. And so that is how we bring it to you. Um, and I would say, this particular pedagogy paper is influenced by obviously that Annenberg study on coaching, but there have been some great new things that have come out just in the last few years. And the way you keep up with them is by reading a lot. I don't think that there's a, a way around that, but how you manage your time if you don't have time to read everything, you don't have to because I read it for you. <laughs> so I guess that's the advantage of being a friend of one schoolhouse. But Sarah, I'll just highlight a couple of the citations. Um, I think the one thing, and this is pretty big picture, but many of you are familiar with the work of Ngozi Adishi, and she talks about the danger of a single story. And this has been influencing, her work has influenced me for years. Um, I'm sure many of you have read, we should all be feminists. But when she talks about a single story, um, it has really helped me understand how one schoolhouse needs to innovate differently, how we need to innovate for inclusivity and how we need to innovate for accessibility. And innovation is in our bones, but doing that in a way that serves a broader audience and holds our traditional audience um, to a different standard to help students see their role in social justice. I think uh, that those fingerprints are all over this pedagogy paper and the paper's aspirational too. There, we have room to grow in what's talked about there. And I think that is probably the citation that is my single biggest influence and motivator for this version. And then there's, there's, some resources that are my go-tos. And this is another answer to your question, Sarah. There are great thinkers and doers out there who I never miss what's new from them. And once you have your short list of who is moving in the space that I want one schoolhouse to move in, it's easier to keep up. It's less overwhelming. So, so that's my advice to the academic deans in the audience is make your short list. Know who you want to keep up with because you can't read everything. But you can always know. For me, that short list is uh, Jim McTie. He has a new or a recent book out on performance tasks that is influencing my thinking around assessment in our courses. Um, the Aurora Institute, they do all the good work on competency-based education, and I always keep up with them. Um, there's a new citation in this paper, New Heschinger Report, and it's on students who are looking for quality online education. The research on online education for a long time just said students want convenience. And um, Hessinger is thinking that there's more to it and it's more nuanced. So, so those are a few of my go-tos. And my advice would be to just find your little list and make sure you're keeping up with it. And we've run a wee bit over, but it um, I know everybody has uh, somewhere to be at noon. Next week, we'll be back at noon. So thank you again, Kareen, for joining, Peter and I. Thank you, Peter. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Sarah.